<clears throat> All right. Sorry about that. I thought I fucked up and that, like, I know some things might look a little weird on the screen. Hopefully what I did fix is it. I did that. And now I'm going to do that. Uh, that's all I know. Anyways, sorry. Um, okay, yeah, going back, we know the mine is not a blank slate. Uh, it has a lot of pre, uh, a lot of functionally specialized domain-specific programs. Cool. Um, knowing the structure of these evolved programs is necessary for understanding what culture it is. Okay, now we go continue forward. Um, yeah, if we know what the structure of those programs are, um, then we get to understand the patterns of within-group similarities and between-group differences. Um, and we'll, we'll, she'll be going over some some papers. Um, we, got, we also got to understand that these are the same mechanisms for receiving different inputs, um, which can create cultural differences. So, like for example, I don't know if you guys remember, but she talked about how in, I think it was in Jerusalem or some space. Um, I don't know much about actually. Yeah, facial attractiveness, like having folks who that culture of like having all the children live in a in a, in a kibbutz like a bunch of children in one space. Um, that's their cohort. And then later on, they recognize that they don't, they don't, they love each other, but they don't see each other as facially attractive or they don't see each other as attractive. Um, and so like th different environments create, uh, um, or different inputs create different, cult uh, create cultural differences. In this case, um, there's a lack of like the want to do incest, um, even though these aren't actually not even incest, just there's a lack of sexual attractiveness. Um, even though like they're not related, they're not uh, family members. They're just a, simply a, a cohort that grew with one another. Um, explains this. These evolved programs explains why some ideas spread better than others, and why some institutions fail, and while whilst others succeed. So she's she's talking about social exchange, or she talked about social exchange. Exchange. Uh, she talked about coalitional psych and race, us versus them. Um, sharing rules, luck versus effort, or organizational psych, coalitional psych with collective action. Uh, for example, like how many people cooperate, or how many people in a group, and, and, and what can they do in a group? What, what's the threshold for like um, people, with free riders, people who, like if you have three people working on a project versus two, how that dynamic works versus four, five, six, for, uh, et cetera. And then she talks about Karl Marx. Um, well, was he right about collective action? And then does collective action have a dark side? Do Does there need to be punishments um, if social contracts aren't fulfilled? Which we're talking more about later and free riders and all that stuff. Hey, cool. Karl Marx. Um, the idea was that if all labor was accomplished through collective action and, and sharing was governed by the decision rule or by um, uh, and a person's ability to contribute, aka from each according to his ability from each according to his ability, to each according to his need. Um, if they can do X work, they'll get repaid um, a certain way. If you do a lot, um, might get, you might get uh, a lot uh, returned in terms of like effort put towards the big group. Um, he also thought that the overthrow of capitalism would bring a, like a really strong economically advanced society. Um, you know, but you know, Karl Marx, all all that communism bullshit. I'm not saying it's bullshit. If you believe in it, go for it. But I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying that it's something she talked about. Um, uh, the the line I pay attention to is the hunter gatherer communal sharing rule, which will emerge once again and dominate social life, which was the idea uh, through Marx. Uh, he thought that that would happen. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just reading this really, really quick. I'm trying to see if there's anything important off this slide. Uh, not really. I guess. Oh yeah, Marxist theory. It, it, all, all this one is saying is that it influenced, it influenced uh, um, the world. Karl Marx's ideas on on communism, and we see it in Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, China, Vietnam. Um, it had an impact on the lives of those folks in those nations. Um, however, not the utopian ones that Marx thought. Utopian was, or Marx wasn't trying to do like a shitty lifestyle for people. He thought this would actually bring some sort of generosity, some sort of richness to people, to the 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 group, to the culture. However, uh, we'll we'll talk more about it later. It, it that that isn't the case. Um, we asked the main question is is his view on hunter gatherer labor and sharing rules correct? If not, what cognitive programs programs regarding cooperation? To the selection pressures endemic to undergather life build. Basically, what, what what was the result 
of hunter-gatherer labor and sharing rules, if they were correct, and, or if they're not correct. Um, anyways, cool. Uh, all right, cool. Hunter-gatherer life. There's a study done on uh, Aceh foragers. Um, this, their lifestyle, they are cooperative. They do share, but as it said, it's not an orgy of indiscriminate cooperation. They're not just giving things up willy-nilly. Uh, there's several alternative sharing rules. There's ways in which these people share their, or th there's ways in which these folks are cooperative. Um, and, and, and these alternative sharing rules are triggers, uh, are the triggers for alternative sharing rules um, uh, depend on the perception of variance due to luck versus effort. Um, we'll talk more about it in a bit. Long story short, if you get something, like if you get a reward, do you get it through luck versus effort? Oh, I just happened to walk into a bunch of food. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to share it to you. Oh, I, had, I worked really hard. I'm not going to give it to you. Um, that's just like a quick synopsis, but she's going to talk more about it. We're going to see more in the later slides. Um, then she talks about how like these cultural patterns are, are evoked. So I remember going back to that, that Israeli example of like that, that environment of how the children were raised affected their, their attractiveness towards one another. Complex patterns can be elicited by external environmental cues. Um, it arises from the evolved mechanism, not transmitted cultural knowledge. Uh, so it's not like these children were taught to not like each other. There's something in us, in ourselves as human beings. Like there were cues that, that created certain outcomes. Um, she talks about how our brains are like the land bus. It's It's got, it's one item. It's got a purpose as a tour bus, but it, it can do that. It can do its job in many different ways. You know, it's a, it's a boat, it's a bus. I don't know. I don't know as I'm going next Friday on that motherfucker. Uh, but uh, so like I said, the same vehicle, same vehicle general function is to transport, but it contains complex machinery that makes it do two, that, that gives it two ways to do its job. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. I was just talking about that experience. And so it talks about the experience, the environment creating, um, or it, it doesn't, it's not like, it's not like it creates the yeah. So the it's not like the environment creates that sort of um, response. It simply activates cues or activates like already already innate things in ourselves uh, to come out. Anyways, okay. So um, many different evolved systems regulate cooperation. Many different programs uh, work on cooperation. So for example, risk pooling, reciprocation, um, the lucky share with the unlucky reverse roles um so like if you're a group of folks working on one mammoth by yourself is terrible but um working with many groups to many folks to take out take down one mammoth um you sort of like like you you pull the risk at what you're doing and you also reciprocate it like hey okay, you know what since since you're putting an effort i'm gonna put an effort you know i might not do so hot now but you'll probably do better later and therefore like we'll like that bat example uh, social exchange, you know, favors different different resources and trade. Collective action. This one goes back to the cooperative hunting, shelter building, um, and the coalitional warfare. I think this one's like, I think these are kind of the same, this one and this one. But I think this one's like interpersonal. This one's like big groups. Oh, yeah. And then uh, we didn't talk about this, that one. So that kind of sucks, but oh well. Anyways, so meat. Variance high due to luck. What that means is, um, you don't really get that much meat often. You have to work for it. Uh, the food is running away. Um, so usually when you get it, it's it's either you put in a lot of effort um, or it's more due to luck. In this case, she I think she was trying to say is if you put in a lot of effort and it could be due to luck. So you, you pull the risk to deal with the frequent reversals of fortune, a.k.a. bad luck. Um, and it's as close as sharing rule to... Um, but what Marx, what Marx uh, said, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Um, and so th there's also gathering foods. So this, these, are, these are examples of what our ancestors would do. For example, let's say hunters would go get meat. Gatherers would go gather foods. Um, variance is low, um, meaning that like you don't really... It's all, you're almost always getting um, gathered food. There, there's not a low variance of success and it's almost always due to effort. So going back meat, there's a lot of effort, um, but it, it isn't always successful. Um, and it's usually due to luck versus gathered foods. So you, you usually, 
uh, that, that work and effort is shared within the family, but it's also the food is shared via reciprocation. I do work, you know, yada, 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 cooperation. And then there's other goods, reciprocation and trade. What gives what gives rise to, to these low variance, high variance responses? Um, is it through gradually acquired uh, uh, domain general imitation with trial and error? Or are minds like the SB land shark? Do we have these alternative sharing rules triggered by the experience of high versus low variance, aka external environmental cues? Do they bring out, do they evoke these patterns within us? You can't merely tell by noting cross-cultural differences because um, different cultures evoke different responses due to different stimuli. Does that make sense? Send me a message that doesn't. Uh, how, shit, I hope this one is like short. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm, I'm going to try to really like get through this. Uh, anyways, knowledge acquired by hunting and gathering. Um, so the... What about people in the in the West? Weird folks, Western educated, industrialized, rich Democrats. We always talk about hunter gatherers, but we never really talk about us, like the normal day to day Af uh, American. So uh, we talked about uh, they they did work on this Japanese and American college students. Um, so there were verbal lottery problems. They were one shot. You 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 one shot. You win or you lose. That's it. Um, those that were um, had high variance were more willing to share. Uh, uh, Sorry, more willing to share high variance and low variance resources, um, even controlling for ide ideologies about distributive justice. Well, so what that, what that means is those that were more lucky, aka had the higher variance chance, um, were more willing to share their resources versus those that were that luck wasn't as important for this one shot lottery problem. Um, anyway, so we asked the question: How quickly do weird people detect resource variance and respond with sharing? Um, do is it is it really something that's within all of us human beings, not just those hunter gatherer folks, but you know Western, um, the educated, industrialized, rich, democratic folks. Um, so risk and the evolution of human exchange. What happens when Southern Californians forage? Do weird people behave like hunter gatherers? Uh, it's just it's just using uh, uh Texans for example. Uh, so eight Texans were I'm not I don't think they're Texans, but I'm just gonna call it Texans. Uh, uh eight Texans were told to forage. Um, there's this VR world. They don't know. Um, they're they're in this world together. They don't know who they are. All they know is that they have avatars and they're different colors. Um, each round, you get to choose where to forage. It's either in a red patch or a blue blue patch. Just like imagine this space here in VR. I'm gonna I'm gonna check that red patch. Red patch is high variance, high mean patch. So AKA there's a there's a low chance of getting what you what you want. Like when when she says higher variance, just thinks like. It's a higher variance of success, okay, a, a low chance of success. But you get a lot in return. For example, like you, you look under a fucking rock and then you find like a, a eatable dead uh, animal carcass versus a blue patch, low variance. You just look at a shrub and you find berries. Clearly, there's a difference in which one has more caloric value. Um, you can put resources in your own pot or another avatar's pot. Um, um, after a round of foraging, avatars can, you, can, you, can communicate but there's no mechanism for enforcing contracts, meaning that it's all cheap talk. Um, like, for example, hey, I'm going to, you know, if you share with me this round, I'll share with you next round. Um, and then next round happens, and then a uh, person shares with me. I don't share with you. I'm not going to get punished. It's cheap talk. This this, this promise was just based solely off word. Um, uh, but, but what's more important is just the fact that you can you can eat, choose to give people your resources and you can choose to keep your resources. Um, there's 20 rounds. Subjects don't know how many. So does spontaneous reciprocal sharing emerge, a.k.a. do people just feel the need to share? There's no reason to share, but do people feel the need to share? Uh, is there is there uh, is there sharing uh, uh, in response to both patches? Like do people share with if they get high and low variants, if they get a lot of food due to high uh, uh, luck or do they get um, low food due to just picking the low food? Um, or, or or sharing triggered when you get a lot of food? Uh, uh, like, for example, like, hey, I, I got this lucky. I'm going to share. Or is it just it doesn't matter if you get lucky or if you choose the, the low variance amount? Um, one sec. Anyways, how long before high variance triggers more sharing? Is it immediate? Is it Does it take time? Is it how many turns is it? And then um, we, we they, they, they try to use this idea to answer the question. Given an ancestral pattern of men hunting specialized in HV resources, um, do men who who find high variance, aka men who find meat, share more than women? 
And we look at the data and it is correct. I mean, uh, sorry, it makes sense. Um, spontaneous reciprocal sharing emerges. Cooperation emerges on the first step. If you look at period one, amount transferred is F5. It happens immediately. Uh, however, uh, for high variance resources, uh, it, it usually, it that one is shared more than the low variance. If you see uh, high variance, high variance, this is men, women, men, women. Low variance is very rarely shared. High variance is almost always shared. Uh, men do share more than, than women. Um, and choosing, men choose more high variance and they also share more high variance. Uh, by the end, HV sharing is 50 fold higher than LV. Um, yeah, that's it. Cool. Uh, so these weird people immediately detected which patch was high variance, high gain versus low variance, low gain. Responded to experience of luck with risk pool sharing, lucky shared with unlucky, and their sharing was reciprocated. Despite anonymity and no contract enforcement. Um, these are the fingerprints of evoked culture, aka um, that pattern was evolved through ed external environmental cues triggered by the situation, not a package of culturally accumulated norms because this happened immediately. It wasn't something that was taught over time. Uh, it kind of it depends. Anyways, uh, <laughs> all revolved systems regulate cooperation. Um, they, they require mechanisms to distinguish folks between reliable cooperators and cheated and free riders. Uh, there's an adaptive problem in hunter-gathering ecologies. It's that every cooperator at some point will fail due to illness, accident, injury, or mistake. If you're working with someone, you, we get this. Like we're gonna do, like right now, we're gonna, hey, we're gonna do homework together. Well, you know, st we still haven't studied, but that's okay because things happen. Um, and that's the adaptive problem. How does that's the adaptive problem? How do we know um, when someone is actually down on their luck or if someone's bullshitting us? It's pretty interesting. Um, Excluding or punishing people motivated to cooperate is a large fitness error, aka if you if you if you think that someone who's motivated is bullshitting you and you and you take them out of your life, you've lost a really nice person versus you know someone who's bullshitting you. Um, it doesn't matter. You know, you it would be better for you to take them out of your life. Um, repeated gains and trade necessary to select for adaptations for collective action, and we'll, we'll more on that later. But the solution. Uh, we use concepts and inference systems that look for and respond to cooperative versus exploitive motivations. We look at motivations. Anyways, uh, distinguishing cooperation from cheaters. I don't know how much time I'm at right now. I'm I'm actually going to check that. I'm sorry, guys. Give me a sec. Is there a way I can tell how much time I'm at? Okay. I don't see shit. Uh, distinguishing. Actually, no, I could do, I could do this. Oh. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out these PowerPoint slides. How do I get out of... Oh, there we go. Um, Yeah, I can finish pretty soon. I still have like an... I think... Sorry, guys. This is take a little long. It's going to take like another 20 minutes. Um, Team current slide. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, anyways. Um, let me look at that. Anyway, situations involving social exchange activate reasoning mechanisms and mechanisms look for cheaters, not innocent mistakes. Exploitative motivations uh, um, versus like genuine motivations and intentions. Situations involving collective action activate a free rider concept. Um, so for example, uh, um, if you know you're going to work in a group, high school, we all work in a group together on a project. If we all know um, that we need to to uh, contribute towards a common goal and then one of us is like well if they need to do effort if we all need to do effort and, and like you know uh, uh, there's a there's a goal reached what if I just do a little bit less effort or maybe no effort at all the goal is still achieved it's better for me to do jack shit because I don't have to put in effort um, uh, this this idea of a free rider is attached to individuals who fail to contribute by virtue of exploitive intent um, not those who fail to contribute by virtue of accident sorry let me put that out of the way Virtue of accident, mistake, or incapacity. incapacity. Uh, anyways, so look, look, look at these sentences. If he's the victim of an unlucky tragedy, then we should pitch in to help him out. These sentences make sense to us. They evoke a sense of, yeah, this person, they got fucked over. Verses 3 and 4 sounds strange. If he's the victim of an unlucky tragedy, then he doesn't deserve our help. It's like, what? If he's down bad, why would you help him out? Or why wouldn't we help him out? If he spends his time loafing and living off others, then we should pitch in to help him out. I had this thought of some people can feel nice, but usually in this scenario, we're thinking of they're, they're loafing and living off of others.
because they're trying to exploit people. Therefore, when we hear that sentence, it'd be okay to think we shouldn't help them out. All right. Anyways, uh, going back or going forward, this guy, I don't. All he did was just he did he did a uh, uh, research paper on on political debates on homelessness, and argue and argued uh, about how bad luck or low effort, uh, uh, or sorry had this research on political debates on homelessness between people from Denmark and people from the U.S. A common thing that people argued about was whether homelessness was due to bad luck or due to a low effort, but no one ever talks about what follows from that. Um, uh, political attitudes and mass cultures are sometimes shaped by mechanisms that evolved for a small-scale small scale social world, a.k.a. since we lived in the... In the, in the when, we, when we were young... Sorry. Our ancestors lived in very small packs. Um, therefore, these current ideas on mass cultures are influenced by that history. We never really lived in, in, in mega cities like these. Therefore, what, what she means by sometimes shaped the me mechanisms that evolved for a small scale social world is the way we think was meant for a smaller inter intersocial group, not millions of people. Okay. Uh, implicit categorization in Denmark and USA using who said what method. Uh, who said what, basically. It's on the previous one, but... Um, yeah, like, which person said what? Um, friends versus social welfare recipients need help. So who is the friend? Uh, uh, who is also a social welfare recipient? What is um, uh, the help? When you learn whether they need... Whether, when you learn whether the need for help is due to bad luck or low effort... Mind cat categorizes by that. That's the what part right there. Um, with evoked cultures, political attitudes can change quickly. Uh, so when we look at luck versus effort, uh, that should trigger different sharing rules. Luck versus effort. Um, some cultural differences may reflect different default assumptions, different stereotypes, rather than different ideologies. Danish is a welfare state, therefore they're much more better off their ideas of like homelessness isn't as strong as the U.S. I feel like in the U.S. we're much more negative. We think it is due to effort. However, in the Danes, it's usually due to luck. They're down on their luck and they got fucked over. Let's help them out. And so can we change Americans into Danes and vice versa? Can we make the Americans think that it's honestly due to luck? And the Danes think, no, the homeless are just not trying. So the, there's these stereotypes of social welfare recipients. Um, imagine a man who's currently on social welfare welfare. Um, the Denmark are, are 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 known to, like, uh, with this sentence of imagine a man who is currently on social welfare. They are unlucky, and then for the USA, they were assigned lazy. Um, the opposition to social welfare was higher in the USA, free rider inference, than in Denmark, unlucky cooperator inference. So, like I said, with Denmark's, we just showed them, hey, or they showed them, hey, this person is unlucky. Imagine a man who is currently on social welfare who is unlucky. Um, they're down on luck. They're, they're motivated. We'll see more in a bit. But opposition to social welfare increases when effort or laziness or free rider inference is 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 uh, uh, brought out more, and it's seen up on the on the left screen. Blue is U.S. Red Denmark. Since since Denmark is less about uh, free rider inference and more about unlucky cooperator inference, they're less opposed to social welfare. Cool. Uh, anyways, what happens if you replace a stereotype with information control? Imagine a man who is currently on social welfare. This is the reciprocator idea. Imagine a man who is current, so control is reciprocator. Imagine a man who is currently on social welfare. He has always had a regular job, but now has been the victim of a work-related injury. He is very motivated to get back to work. Cheater. This person is a free rider in this example. Imagine a man who is currently on social welfare, but he has never had a regular job, and he's fit and healthy. He's not motivated to get a job. What happens? So, so lazy cues, opposition increases a fuck ton. When, you, when it's through the low effort, opposition decreases dramatically. Uh, um, U.S. And, and Denmark are the same. Uh, yeah, they are different cultural ideas, but what's important is just the general uh, uh, difference of the, the these two. Like, uh, you know, hey, control, whoa, whoa, uh, that three stars mean is a significant difference. You guys know that. You guys took it to me. Organizing labor as a collective action. So, collective action and coalitional cooperation. Three plus individuals cooperate to achieve a common goal and share the resulting benefits. Talking about a high, level, a high school group, for example. Um... Bunch of gatherers engaged in collective action and intergroup conflict, so small-scale warfare and also resource acquisition. That's sort of the goals, the collective action, the co coalitional cooperational goals that are going on to deal with conflict and to de deal with resource acquisition, big game hunting and shelter burying. 
shelter building, sorry. Cognitive foundation of teamwork, business, and organizational behavior has to be here because it's something that we've been dealing with since, you know, ancestors, all that. Um, uh, so there's a problem with free, ride, free riders. Uh, cooperating in groups of three plus uh, and sharing the resulting benefit creates an incentive for those to free ride, to contribute less than others. If I get the same share of the benefit, whether it is to contribute as much as others is not, then my payoff is higher if I contribute less. Uh, but everyone else in the group has the same incentive to free ride. So everyone stops contributing and then common good is not produced. Think of it as effort. If everyone knows that you put in a little bit of effort, things go well. One person starts putting down effort, people start following, then there goes the goal. If that makes sense. I'm going to repeat it again. Imagine a group. One person, or everyone puts in a little bit of effort, the goal is achieved. Everyone puts in effort, but then one person stops putting in effort. And the next person seems less uh, feels less incentivized to put an effort, and then yada, and then like dominoes they fall. I should be talking about that. Anyway, so how does natural selection evolve this or solve this problem? Who counts as a free rider? Who counts, or how do contributors deal with free riders? Free riders, uh, how their mind defines them. Not just contributing less. Um, every cooperator will at some time fail to contribute due to mistake and injury. So free riders don't exist just because they're contributing less, but also just might be to do to bad luck. Um, excluding, uh, don't always think of free riders as a negative thing. Like I said, it could be due to bad luck. Um, usually, but not always. Ex excluding or punishing people motivated to cooperate is a large fitness error. Fucking someone over who's clearly for you and trying to work with you is going to hurt you more. It's going to, it's going to hurt the project, uh, more than it's going to, to, to get the benefit out of punishing. And you'll see why in a second. Um, you need to distinguish between good cooperators from exploiters. Um... Important to distinguish cooperative form from exploitative, exploitive motivations using the who said what paradigm um, to understand implicit categories. So in this scenario, there was a plane that crashed, eight folks, some were injured, some were alive, well and healthy, and, and they all agreed to forage and bring back food to everyone to share. Subject sees what eight these eight men did on five days, subject being the, the participant. Um, each fails to bring back food on two of the five days, but for different reasons. So this, it suggests exploitive versus cooperative intent. Free riders, um, example one, all found food on those days. But four men ate what they found. Four accidentally lost what they found. So red is free riders. Blue is bad luck. Um, experiment two, none found food on those two days. But four men didn't bother to look. Four tried hard but failed to find. Like I said, red is free riders. Blue is cooperators. Results, implicit categorization by intent, exploitive intent categorized as free riders, not those with cooperative intent. Um, yeah, it, it sliced the, the moral domain very finely as in the categoriz categorization between free rider and cooperator. Distinguished free riders even from those who steal group resources. Um, so like, you know, they did find food, but they stole, stole a free rider. Um, and then more than two, the problem of cheating and repeated two persons cooperation exchange. If the other person cheats you, you cannot protect yourself by no longer interacting with him or her. Or sorry, you can't. So if it's just me and you, let's say Cammy or you or, or Cammy and I or, or Bella and I have a project to do and I clearly don't do a good job. You guys have the option of just saying, fuck you. I'm not going to work with you anymore. And it's not going to cost you much because you don't have to interact with them. But. In an end person collective or in, in a big group and being any number of people, you can't really do that often. You can't really distance yourself from one free rider because if you do, you usually assuming we're assuming you distance yourself from the whole cooperating group, which just makes things worse. Solution is to keep the group and punish the free riders. Evolved solution, um, irrational punitive sentiments, or, or you, you create irrational punitive sentiments against free riders. Um, do people freely contribute to collective actions that produce public goods from each component of the... Oh, yeah. So going back to the whole Marx thing, do, do people freely contribute to collective actions that produce public goods? Um, no. Is punishment needed to stabilize contributions to collective actions? Yes. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how I can explain that first one. Do people freely contribute to collective actions that produce public goods? I guess do people... Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is no such thing as as, a, as an orgy of indiscriminate uh, uh, assistance. There, there, there is something in place that makes you choose uh, um, who gets what, depending on who said what. And then uh, punishment is needed to stabilize or, or to create a constant stream of, of, of motivation 
uh, because if you're not punished, we'll see why it doesn't do. If there's no level of punishment, you'll see, we'll see why in a second how it actually does you worse than good. So public good games, experimental econ economics. Um, so everyone, this is a group of four. Everyone gets money. They get to choose to donate to the to the pool of money. If they do, the money gets multiplied by a certain amount. The more money you put in, the more money everyone gets. Um, the less money you put in the, into the into the pot, the less money everyone makes because you're not putting you're not not as much as being multiplied. So you can choose to keep your money, let other people put in money, and then like they're they're a little bit lowered because they pulled it, it has to be multiplied. Um, but you're getting a net benefit because you didn't put in any money in while other folks did. Um, that's like an example of what a free rider can do in this game. Um, yeah, it's divided equally. It uh, the pool. Uh, anyways, so short term prof profit maximizing predicts 100% free riding. No one pays to punish free riders. AKA, you you're really incentivized to not put money in because if someone else does, that's an immediate win for you. Um, and then we're also assuming no one pays to punish free riders. Um, however, does the institution matter? Institution think of it as rules. So the rules in this game, like this society, is that no one gets punished for 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 being a free rider. Um, but in this case. Can a different institution or can a different rules of the game change? Uh, so we, we see this. So uh, folks, so when there when there is punishment, um, average contributions go up. So for example, um, in the bottom one, white and we like any honestly, white means no no punishment. So when when there was no punishment, the average contributions was lower than when there was punish, punishment. Um, reason being, what we can do is uh, you can pay money to punish people who, who, who aren't contributing to the pot. Um, like in this game, you can see who's not contributing. And so it's, it's sort of like when, when there is a punishment, there's an incentive. People can recognize your free writing. A professor described it as if, if like enough people are noticing that you're fucking people over, you're, you're seen as like, you're, you're basically being pushed out of the group. Um, and your, our bodies and minds want to not deal with that. And instead, uh, work with everyone, but the second you take off punishment, the the total contributions go down. All right, um, same thing here. So uh, when it, when it's when it's people you know, it's usually higher. When it's strangers, it's usually higher. But still, sorry, when it's with people you know, it's usually higher. When it's with strangers, the average contribution is lower, but there's still a difference between when there is punishment and when there isn't punishment. Um. And then you could also change, uh, um, you could also be able to express disapproval points. So uh, not only are you able to punish the people, but you also be able to tell them like, hey, you're like being a dickhead. Um, so in, in these graphs, what happened was, this is the game without disapproval points. Then all of a sudden, rounds 10 to 20, there are disapproval points. And then once again, rounds 20 to 30 there they take away disapproval points and you can just see that there's a difference a lot of disapproval a lot of disapproval pretty high i don't know what's up with that first part though but pay attention to, excuse me pay attention to that, that top graph top graph what predicts when individuals contribute contributors print free writers negative deviation from own high contrib contribution how much less is he contributing than me um uh, negative deviation from group average. How much less is he contributing than the group average? So we look when when it comes to um like what what makes us want to punish free riders is how much less is he contributing than me? So how how like if I'm putting in twenty bucks and he's putting in zero, I'm noticing how the difference in group contribution. Like that's dollars. This is numbers we're using here. Versus fifteen to twenty bucks. Like I put in twenty, he puts fifteen, and I'm like, you know what? He put in 15 lower than me, but he didn't put zero, so I'm not going to be that mad at him. I'm not going to give him shoot. I'm not going to shoot him too many disapproval points. Um, and then we also think of like compared to everyone else. So like I put in 20 bucks, guy puts in zero, my friends put in 20. He's clearly like he's he's not doing as good. Versus, uh, we we all I put in 20, he puts in 15, buddies put in 20. And we're like, you know what? We won't get too mad at you. You're still trying. Um, and so punishment increases. And contribution from free riders, so uh, x-axis goes from no punishment to most punishment. So like, when there's no punishment, average rel relative contribution is lower. Once there is increased punishment, 
the average contribution goes high. Does that make sense? All you need to know is that punishment increases contributions from free riders. When punishment is not possible, collective action unwinds. People monitoring how much uh, people monitor how much others are contributing. They pay they pay special attention to the group average. If I'm contributing more than the group average, I ratchet back my contribution to group average. So if I'm doing if I, if I'm shooting 25 and everyone's doing 20, or like 15, next round I'm gonna go. You know I'm gonna do 15 because no one's doing 25. No one's matching me. Uh, over iterations, over over generate over like rounds, um, the average gets lower and lower. The goal fails. Um, yeah, okay. She talked about. No, nah, I don't want to. That's not that important. Anyways, evidence so far suggests that the human mind has motivational systems that lower one's level of contribution when this does not adversely affect or the welfare of oneself, one's family, or one small circle of cooperators. So they they know we know when to to lower the the level of effort, but we know this is not going to have a, a huge effect on my safety, my family's safety, or my social group uh, around me. Um, lower the effort when uh, when others are free riding, um, and also increase contribu contributors punitive sentiments towards free riders, aka we were good at recognizing. Um, but we should start punishing people for being free riders, including presumably the punitive sentiments felt by leaders and those in coercive military social roles. Don't know what that means. I'm sorry. Is coercion a predictable effect? Um, sufficiently large collective actions decoupled reward from this effort, from, from effort, initiating a process of declining effort by some, which stimulates matching withdrawals by others. What this means? What this means is. Um, So when you have like a huge collection of folks and you take away reward from effort, uh, it, it creates a process of declining effort, which stimulate which stimulates um, uh, a withdrawal from others. Matching withdrawal, like people withdraw with one another or as they see others. This free riding and the dwindling participation, it engenders and intensifies punitive sentiments towards under contributors, culminating in social systems organized around coercion and punishment. Or rulers can deploy for it. So you kind of have to have some sort of reward, effort, punitive action type system in order to, for things to happen. The second, okay, I'll tell you the example. There is this research where men had one common goal to cut a bunch of sugar and produce sugar cane. They would not be paid until after they finished cutting sugar cane. What they learned was that. Um, men would cut sugar cane and they would notice others would start working less and others would start working less. And you know, eventually you get to the point where like, we don't need to do this anymore. We're not even getting paid yet. Um, and so once you took away that, that reward at the end, once you make the reward go at the end versus at the moment, it changes how things work. Yeah, people under contribute. Um, and so it's important to have the reward almost be immediate, but then also like, um, have immediate, uh, um, uh, punitive actions towards under contributors uh, dissolution of the collective action where they cannot anyways we're getting towards the end joseph, joseph stalin terrible shitty motherfucker was the act of coercion due to his personality or the way human nature interacts with institutions or both he got a lot of things done unfortunately um and just how he used punishment was he due to his personality or was it due to the way that he built this space or was it both um so uh is large-scale collective action a good thing? The design of institutions, a.k.a. Marxism, a.k.a. Joseph Stalin, and creating that communist state where the government seizes all means of production. Um, factories, farms, and restaurants all involve multi-individual cooperation and hence collective action. Should these projects be organized as public goods that benefit everyone equally, regardless of their effort or contribution? Or should payoffs be organized such that effort is rewarded and free riding is punished? Um, the iterative ratchet effect, agricultural policy in the Soviet Union, right? Uh, state, you know, seized means of uh, public, or uh, seized means of production. Um, however, they allowed 3% of land on collective farms to be held privately. This 3% uh, produced 45 to 75% of all vegetables, meats, milks, eggs, and potatoes consumed in the Soviet Union. The rest of the 97% made up for the other 
uh, uh, 55 to 25%. Just think about it. 97%. The other fucking portion did jack shit compared to the 3% that was privately owned. The quality of land on the collectively held plots was the same. Um, the, it was the iterative ratchet effect. People shifted their efforts away from collective to private jobs. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. People shifted their efforts away from the from the collective to the private jobs. Yeah, I just think that when 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 the effort that you put in gives you what you put in, like okay, sorry, when the when the benefit you gain depends on the effort you put in, people would choose to do more of the private sector work than the collective, which was no matter how much you work put in, you'd all get based equal pay, which wasn't as good. Without these private plots, it is unlikely that even more people in the Soviet Union would have starved. AKA, if it wasn't for this 3%, a lot died, but if it wasn't for this 3%, a lot more would have died. Anyways, reasoning instincts, social exchange. The human mind contains a neurocognitive adaptation that is functionally specialized for reasoning about social exchange, which includes a subroutine for detecting cheaters. This neurocognitive system reliably develops in the human cognitive architecture in a species-typical manner. It's a component of human nature. It's a cognitive foundation of trade. When legal institutions prohibit and sanction the use of coercion and fraud, private trade can promote social welfare. Mind is well equipped to compute own preferences. There's no unbounded rationality problems. Um, uh, and it doesn't matter. Each individual agrees to trade only if they believe they will be better off. Trade picks out benefit benefit interactions. This, allowing, this allows taking benefit at someone else's expense. Creating increasing levels of social welfare over time. Uh, if we remove restrictions on or removing restrictions on private trade is rarely proposed as a means of advancing general social welfare. Why? Perhaps because the psyche of social exchange produces intuitions about private gain rather than public good. Why is collectivism so appealing? Perhaps because the psychology of collected action produces intuitions about enhancing welfare of the group. But think about modern skulls, hoes, our Stone Age minds. There's a mismatch. Mismatch. Um, our minds are equipped with programs that evolved to navigate a small world of relative friends and neighbors, small groups, not for cities and nations of thousands or millions of anonymous folks. Certain laws and institutions satisfy the moral intuitions that these programs generate, but because these programs are now operating outside the envelope of environments for which they were designed, laws that satisfy the moral intuitions they generate may regularly fail to produce the outcomes we desire and to So she gave us an example. When it came to rent control, it was believed that rent control would be a good thing. The whole process was... It, it, uh, homelessness it's due to usually two things it's due to weather if there's a nice space people can live on the streets if it's if it's cold or if it's raining all the time it's hard for them to live there that was one determining thing the other thing was rent control for some or not for some other reason if you had people determine the rent pricing if you had institutions that that is that assumed that this was for a public good it actually turned out to not work because um, you would, you would, uh, there would be less effort for folks to meet that equal, that equal price of all renting spaces. And so it's definitely some spaces were better than others, but they were all priced really fucking high. And so you get a lot of shitty places that are just being run down and unrented, um, that are costing ridiculously an amount of money. And you're having like, okay, spaces that are still being charged a ridiculous amount of money. Versus places that have little to no rent control, there's a lot less homelessness. Why? Because the spaces that are a lot shittier are priced way less. They're not. They're not as high uh, as compared to places with rent control. Even even worse, they may cause us to overlook policies that have that have the consequences we wish. These mental programs so powerfully structure our inferences that that certain policies may seem self-evidently correct and others self-serving or immoral. But modern conditions often produce outcomes that seem paradoxical to our evolved programs. Um, venal motives can be the engines that reliably produce humane outcomes and see what like and what seem like good intentions can make hell on earth. Mind control. And then she ends it with this. So go, save the world, but do it using what you know. And then I started the clap and then we called it. Okay, control shift H. Uh, hopefully this goes through. Take care. Uh, brush your hair. Bye.